Okay, we're starting off the news uh, section a bit differently than normal, uh, rather than just going through a bunch of different stories. Uh, we're just going to be using the two news segments to be talking about some serious issues that are going on right now with actual experts. Uh, so for the first section, uh, we're going to be talking about what the hell is going on with uh, Republicans trying to fuck over the LGBT community. And for uh, for covering that, uh, we do have Callie Wright joining us, who has the distinction of actually covering more than one of the letters in that acronym. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. I do. I do. In fa- I do indeed. <laughs> yeah. Right. I have yes. officially been promoted to a uh, topic, uh, just figurehead. I mean, you are the person. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's a lot of weight to carry guys. On. Yeah. No. <laughs> the weight of the community is on your shoulders. <laughs> no pressure. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. All right. So one of the, the big things that, that has come up recently that kind of got me wanting to go for, you know, just what the hell is going on? You're you're in, in Cincinnati, which is where the uh, Republican National <laughs> I didn't Convention know you were actually at, at Ground Zero is happening. <laughs> no, 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 it's actually happening in Cleveland. Oh, which is about oh, four sure. hours okay. north of me. Oh, yeah. OK. Oh. Sorry. I, I, I saw some incorrect stuff then uh, they were they were courting cincinnati really really hard uh the reason cincinnati didn't win is because there was there was like five or six million dollars in uh upgrades that had to have happened oh. to the arena that they wanted to do it before they could so mm. and i guess cleveland had a more like ready-made mm. like you can just do the thing here so yeah okay and so what they they're they're they've got for their platform is all kinds of crazy anti-LGBT stuff. It's including trying to get... <laughs> like, yeah, like, everything let's just, imaginable. Let's just make a list of all of the bad things that we want to happen to the LGBT community, and it's their platform. Like, that's literally what it is. <laughs> that is a really good way of putting it. <laughs> yeah, you take... I mean, it's conversion therapy, opposition uh-huh. to equality, bathroom bill, like, I mean, it's everything. <laughs> take all progress that's happened or that we'd like to see happen... And reverse it. Yeah. Yeah. Literally. Wow. So pretty much if you had the Westboro Baptist Church, you had Kim Davis, you had Mike Pence, uh, asshole from uh, pretty, pretty much every asshole that's out there. They just pretty much wrote the, the RNC's platform. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that's accurate. I think, like. I think this is a fair way to put that. Yeah. I know the American Family Association was heavily involved. So it was focused on the family. Oh, yeah. And, the other oh, far yeah. religious right asshole hate groups. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and it's, and it's, you know, well, and, and it's, it's funny because, you know, like any organization that has family in the name, you know, they're, or they're a hate group. Like mm-hmm. that's, that's pretty much, that's pretty much the deal. And, uh, and it's just, it, it's amazing to me that these groups, I mean, if you look at the, the laws that have been introduced, like the laws that kind of mirror HB2, like the bathroom bills, mm-hmm. um, what I was reading is because I, I had the the I had the opportunity to speak to someone who works for the human rights ca- uh, campaign and a person who is actually it's her job to keep track of anti LGBT le- legislation and someone in the room asked the question you know is there like a shadow group behind this pushing all of this and she's like you know we don't really know for sure. But some of the wording in those bills looks really like there's all of these different bills that have really suspiciously similar wording. Mm. And so they actually think that it's, you know, lawyers from one of these anti LGBT hate groups that are actually like writing these bills like ready made for people. There's there's a little bit of uh, overlap with like the uh, uh, in God we trust in in churches or sorry in uh, public offices also that it's a small group that just sends this stuff out to you know city council board councils across the country and it's just boilerplated in so maybe yeah. it's another little group like that well at the national level the legislators don't actually have time to actually legislate because they're too busy with with fundraising and yeah. at the state level <laughs> right. they usually don't actually make enough money to not either be doing favors for people who are actually funding them or actually having to work another job. So they don't have enough time to really do their own job. So yeah, of course, when somebody hands them a bill, they'll go ahead and do it. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And, and it's, 
it's just it's sad because i mean these people get elected to write laws you know it, it, that that are supposed to be you know of of a nature that is good for the public and it's like no we're going to go ahead and seed that we're going to go ahead and seed that to hate groups we're we're just going to let people like the most vitriolic hateful people we're going to go ahead and let them write the laws and it's and you know and it's it's done in secret because like i said this you know this lady that i was talking to i mean it's her job to track this stuff and she's like yeah we don't we don't really know who's doing it but like it has to be somebody because you know like the wording is so much the same so Mm -hmm. yeah it's just i mean like it sounds conspiracy theory-ish right like it sounds like a paranoid (laughs) thing but it's like i mean if you look at the the evidence it's legitimately there you know so it's yeah yeah and and, you know the whole conspiracy theory thing when you're grasping it at straws to put it together then that's crazy but there are actual conspiracies from time to time. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is a good example of that. Okay, so some of the things, you, you know, you went through some of them, but they want to get the Supreme Court decision legalizing same-sex marriage overthrown. I, Which, like, that's a notoriously hard thing to do in the first place, uh-huh. to reverse a Supreme Court decision. So, like... I don't have a lot of confidence. I, I, I think that's more that's more like virtue signaling, I guess, than anything else. Like we're putting in this platform so people know that we're there. Like I don't know that they actually think that's a thing they're going to do. Well, one of the things to make it somewhat one of the hard one of the hardest things that would would do would be what the hell do you then do with the thousands or millions of people that have entered into same sex marriages? Well, in, in Australia, they actually had legalized gay marriage for I think it was like a day or two days or something like that. And then they reversed it. And all of those marriages were just made null and void. Wow. Uh, and, and I have to imagine in the nightmare scenario where that happens here, that's probably what would happen. Well, that's happened in a couple states where it was just a couple days before it, it got stopped. But then there are other states where... It went on long enough before they stopped it. They went ahead and they just said, all right, if it's already happened, it's done. Right. And so some of those earliest people to have, you know, same-sex marriages, they're in states where it wasn't allowed anymore, but they were grandfathered in. Right, right. And Which, I mean, I don't know, because because the thing is, you know, with this, the Supreme Court decision, I mean, there was no law that was passed there. It was them interpreting the Constitution to say that the law protects this already. You know, so it's not like repealing a law or anything like that. It's just, okay, well, we're going to we're going to reinterpret this law. You know, we're going to reinterpret the four because it's basically the 14th Amendment mm-hmm. that they're that they're worried about. Um, so it's like we're going to we're going <laughs> to the 14th Amendment says this. No, actually, it says a different thing. Like, it's just the whole thing is just so like when you think about it, like when you really, really think about it, it's like, is this seriously how the system works? Like this is this is a thing that can be done. <laughs> well, it, you got enough money, you can do anything you want. <laughs> that well, right? Yeah, that's true. the The originalist argument with the Fourteenth Amendment is that when it was passed, it only applied to black men. That black men and white men were equal, and black women and black and white women were were equal, and so it didn't deal with anything other than just race. Well, the wording is vague enough that it does leave it open to any group who says I want to be equal to should be covered under it. Right. And I mean, I'm, I'm not a lawyer or a legal expert of any kind by any stretch of the imagination, but I mean, the wording is pretty like, I mean, it it can pretty clearly be interpreted to include almost anything, Mm -hmm. which, which, which I think is a good thing, by the way, I don't think Mm -hmm. that's a bad thing. Um, But it's just, it's amazing to me how, how much of a fight that seems to be like that. I just, I don't know. (laughs) It's exhausting. (laughs) Like, like this really bad thing is happening to gay people because they're gay. Yeah. Sorry. That's not a thing we're really concerned about. Really? Like we're, we're we're okay with saying like, okay, race-based hate crimes are a thing. Like there there should be, there should be enhanced penalties for hate crimes based on race or based on uh, gender, even in some places based on sexuality, uh, because there are some state laws that that actually have, uh, there's some states that have hate crime laws that include uh, sexual orientation and their, and their hate crime statutes. Almost nowhere does it include gender identity or gender expression. And, and it's, it's, it's amazing to me how that's not a logical conclu- logical conclusion that people would draw like okay if, if we're going to agree that there should be enhanced penalties for hate crimes we should probably be able to agree that like trans people experience 
hate related violence. People are murdered for being trans. People are attacked mm-hmm. and beaten for being trans. So like if we're going to say that we think hate crimes are a thing and there should be enhanced punishments, I don't understand how there is an argument against including trans people or including gay people in that. Like it just, I, I can't even doing my very, very best to make their position look as reasonable as possible. I just don't understand it. Yeah. You're assholes. <laughs> Well, right. I mean, that's what it really comes down to, I think. It's fingers in their ears going, no, 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 I don't want to hear you. Well, right. I, I think it's it's a combination of of bigotry, like outright bigotry, like, no, gay and trans people make me uncomfortable, so I'm not going to do anything to make their lives easier. But I also think a lot of times it's indifference. It's, you know, this isn't personal to me. It's not personal to anyone I care about, so I just don't care. And so when someone tries to talk Gingrich to me about ar- argument. Right. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Well, and, and there's definitely uh, the the angle where if it doesn't affect them and they don't care or they're, they're biased against you know the people in that group, they're not going to see what they're claiming to actually be valid. They're just going to ignore it. Intentional uh, ignorance. Right. Yeah. It, you can't. Yeah, it comes down to they do what with their body? Ew. And... <laughs> I want the fuck out. Right. I mean, that, that's literally what it is. Cause any conversation I've ever had with anyone, like, you know, they can, like, on the surface, they can make these arguments that may just on the very, very surface sound intellectual. But, like, when you dip down even just the tiniest little bit below the surface, what it really comes down to is gay people are gross, trans people are gross. That whole thing makes me really uncomfortable. And that's, that's what it comes down to. Mm-hmm. You, I think usually you you scratch that just a tad more, and it comes down to the Bible still, uh, for a lot of people. Well, no, I, I think I think part of the reason why it makes people uncomfortable is because of the religious attitude. Yeah. Um, so so yeah, I mean uh, th- that's definitely what it is. It's you know the the idea of of masculinity and what masculinity is supposed to be, and you know uh, there's men trying to be women that's gross, or men having sex with men that's gross. Like that's why that's why lesbians get a pass. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, because that's hot. Exactly. Because it is. <laughs> I, I I basically it's it's really easy. Like okay, are people having sex in front of me? No. Are they doing it like out of my view? Okay, then it, I don't really fucking care. And, well, right. All right. So let's let's help them out like everybody else. You know, I I I don't want to see people of any. I don't want to see people fucking in front of me unless I'm paying for it. So <laughs> <laughs> and you know, so I I don't see I don't see an an ick factor there. I'm like I I, I don't know that I, I don't think it's gross to be. For anybody having sex, you know, it, it's consensual. They enjoy it. Fuck it. Do it. I just don't see the the need to be an asshole about it. Well, it's, and again, I mean, you know, w- when we're getting down to it, you know, I mean, the idea is that, you know, we're supposed to have really strong opinions and views on what other people do and that, you know, because we don't like a thing, we should be able to prevent other people from doing it. Right. And it's I mean, that I mean, that mentality you know, I don't think I could confidently say that that mentality would disappear completely without religion, but I think religion is probably the primary driver of that because, because there's, I mean, there's really no other reason to care. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and, and I, I really do think it's the religious viewpoint that teaches us like, no, we are the experts on morality for everyone else. And we're the ones that have to fix all of these broken you know, so so I mean, I I do think it, it boils down to that in a lot of ways. I think I think the impulse maybe goes a little deeper than just religion. Um, I, I think there's there's the the general sort of fear of the unknown that is kind of baked into our species because, you know, when we were living in the jungle, anything that we weren't sure of, we had to assume was a threat to survive, right? Mm-hmm. So like, I, I I definitely think that there's 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 sort of a natural impulse that that's at the base of this, um, but I, I, that's not an excuse as much as it's an explanation. Like we understand where this is coming from, so now we know how to dismantle it. Going back to the the is it all tied to religion angle? Uh, mm-hmm. I know for myself, my homophobia outlasted my religion by several years, and it took. 
to a certain extent, uh, I, I started listening to the Savage Love cast before I knew Dan Savage was gay. Yeah. Then I found out he was gay, and it was like, okay, that makes me uncomfortable. I need to fight that. And every gay caller he had for the probably the almost probably almost a year made me really uncomfortable. Huh. And after that, it was just normal. But it took it took effort. Yeah, I, I think there are a lot of cases where um, people people leave religion behind, but they don't realize that there are a lot of other ideas they have that stem from their religious belief mm-hmm. that they don't think did, you know, because, uh, and, and this isn't universally true, but I mean, people who grow up in fundamentalist religion, I mean, it's basically their entire worldview is shaped by their religion, even things that they wouldn't necessarily tie back to that, you know? So I, I definitely think there's a good argument to be made that, you know, even, people who are atheists who remain homophobic or transphobic, like the fact that they're atheists doesn't necessarily negate religion's role in that because right. I mean, we all grow up in this culture that has been molded and shaped by, you know, the dominant Christian narrative. Um, but, but I do think it's important to call out, you know, that, uh, you know, I think, I think religion, like when you, when you boil things down to the root, Religion is real close to the root, but I'm not sure it's the entire root, if that makes sense. I yeah. think re- religion is is another manifestation of our need to control our environment, including the other people around us. And, and, I, and I think there's a certain degree of that that's baked into our species by evolution. And, uh, and, and again, it's not an excuse. It's not saying like these things are okay because of that. But I do think it's important to understand where it's coming from so we know not to do it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, it, it's the, the catalyst that keeps it going. Oh, Without that, absolutely. it would die. Absolutely. I agree with that for sure. Uh, so w- one other uh, angle I definitely want to cover. Uh, one of the things that is in the, the GOP platform is uh, making sure that trans people don't get to use the bathroom they are more, most comfortable with. Uh, yeah. Callie, you have a, a you, you have, a, you know, you, you, you pee and you poop and sometimes you use public restrooms, right? I do. I do <sighs> indeed. I do indeed. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and it ain't so. when, when you go into a public restroom, I, I, I'm, I'm sure it is just to relieve yourself, not to uh, try to take advantage of people that are there, right? That, that would also be accurate. Okay, and is it also fair to say that most assholes are uh, straight men? Yes, that is 100% fair to say. <laughs> okay, and that most violence against trans people is caused by straight men? Yep. <laughs> So I'm guessing you wouldn't ever be comfortable going into a men's restroom. No, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, and in in this this whole thing, I mean, it's 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 one of the most exhausting conversations that I have to have. And and, and I mean, and I, I don't mean to say like like God, why'd you guys bring me on here to talk <laughs> about this? Like, because because I mean, the conversation obviously has to happen, right? Like, we have to fight against those things. But I just like I just keep thinking to myself, like, you know, there was a point in my life where like music was the only thing that I cared about. And then at some point I was like, you know what? This activism thing makes a lot of sense to me. And like, I literally never in a million years thought like, yeah, this activism thing is going to be cool. And you know what I'm going to do with my activism? I'm going to talk about taking a piss. That's gonna <laughs> oh, be yeah. Let's do that. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that never even entered into my mind. And, and, and now it's like, I mean, that's like the only conversation people are having about trans people now. And it's, and it's so frustrating because it's, because, I mean, it, it's the biggest red herring in the world, right? Because, you know, all of a sudden people are care- like, oh, what about the children? What about our women? You know, and it's like, well, you know what? First of all, what about your young boys? Because not a single one of you assholes ever, ever proposed banning uh, convicted sex offenders from public restrooms. They're already in the bathrooms with your kids and you mm-hmm. didn't give a shit until transness enters the conversation. So don't try and tell me that you're doing this to protect people because you're not, it's transparent. Like you, you're, uh-huh. you're not doing this because you care about anyone's safety because you didn't give a shit about anyone's safety until transness entered the, entered into the conversation. So, and then conversely, like, I mean, there's, there's evidence that these laws don't make anyone more unsafe, right? There, I mean, there, there are hundreds of places, people don't realize this. There are hundreds of cities across the country that have inclusive laws that let trans people use the fucking bathroom. And in, it, it simply has not been a problem. I mean, it really has not. And then conversely, 
there is very much evidence to suggest that when you pass these anti-trans laws, that people actually do get hurt as a result. And people like Mm -hmm. me become objectively less safe as a result. I mean – in uh, and, and I forget the numbers. I was in the room once where there was a person talking about – they were doing the numbers on passing a non-discrimination law in Ohio. And so the calculation that our community has to make to give you the context here is, okay, so we want to push for a non-discrimination law in Ohio that covers – uh, that covers sexual orientation, that covers gender identity and expression, uh, you know, when it comes to public accommodations, when it comes to employment uh, and housing and, and you know, all areas of life, right? So, yeah. so here's the calculation we have to make. Do we have enough support to actually do this, right? So mm-hmm. if, we, if we put this effort forth, do we think we have a reasonable chance of success? And there, there's – the pragmatic reason for that is that if we mount this fight and use all our resources and lose, that's a devastating blow. And we're going to have to spend a whole lot of time recharging uh, before we can do it again. The other side, the side that's not generally known or talked about is the fact that we know these fights actually have casualties, right? Because violence against our community increases whenever these fights happen. People become less safe because of these fights. We saw it in Houston when they were trying to pass, um, the Houston Equal Rights Amendment. I mean, there were trans women who were walking into City Hall simply to stand up and say, I'm not a predator. And they're being spat on in the mm. way to City Hall. And they have people posting guards outside the bathrooms, like vigilante people posting guards outside the bathrooms, making sure that trans people don't get into the bathrooms, right? This is the stuff that happens when we advance these fights. So it's not an academic conversation that happens in a vacuum, right? Like Mm -hmm. there are actual consequences. When we decide to have these fights, we are putting ourselves in danger. Yeah. Like, like it, it's, it's not just a matter of we can do this or we can't do this. You know, when we put ourselves out there, we are putting our safety at risk. And, uh, and, and that's something that I don't think gets generally talked about, you know? So like, so like I have to take it seriously when a Tennessee state lawmaker says, I'm going to stomp a mud hole into any man in a dress, quote unquote, that I see in a bathroom. I have to take that seriously. Or, you know, when I see somebody running for sheriff in Texas saying that like, I'm going to knock somebody's teeth out. I'm going to give somebody a free sex change, um, you know, because I'm going to beat the shit, beat the shit out of them because I found them in quote unquote the wrong bathroom. Right. Like it'd be a different story if there was no dominant narrative in our, in our society that makes us unsafe and that encourages and condones violence against us. Right. If, if that were the case, we could just ignore people saying stuff like that because they're like these fringe people out there saying silly things that no one takes seriously. But like people do take it seriously and you know, the, the, the state lawmaker that I mentioned, the guy running for sheriff that I mentioned when they said those things, they faced zero consequences as a result. Oh, I'm sure like their, their, their ratings got a bump in the positive direction. Right. Exactly. So, um, so, you know, I, I think, you know, it, it's important to celebrate progress. Uh, I mean, for a lot of reasons, because there has been progress. I mean, um, I, I think I'm I'm a little bit less radical than some of my friends and that I was actually really excited about uh, marriage equality because I think marriage is important for people who want it. Um, mm-hmm. But I also on the other side of things, I recognize like that's far from the the most pressing issue that we face when, uh, you know, so many of us are denied health care. So many of us are denied housing and, you know, we face violence for being who we are. Um, but, um, you know, it, it's. <sighs> God, mm-hmm. <laughs> I get, I get, I get worked up if you can't, if you, if you couldn't tell, you know, in the meantime, you know, I'm, I'm sure at the end of this year, we're going to be commemorating at least 40 or more people in the United States who have been murdered be specifically because they were trans because a trans woman had the audacity to flirt with a guy who found out she was trans and decided that he didn't like that. And cause that's, I mean, that's the stuff that happens. You know, so like it, it's so frustrating to me that the conversation is like, oh, like we can't let you pee in the bathroom because you're going to hurt our kids. No, first of all, fuck you, because you're more of a threat to your kids than I am statistically. And second of all, like, can we not talk about the fact that like there are people out there who would straight up murder me for having the audacity to flirt with them? Like, that's a thing that happens. 
you know, the fact that the the barriers to to healthcare are so high, uh, like there, I mean, there are all of these things, that, and and it just it feels like we pick the most petty stuff because because obviously the conversation is not about us. The conversation is about. You know, well, if we give trans people equality, what does that mean for us? Sorry, I don't give a shit. This is not about you. You know, really? I mean, (laughs) logically, though, what does it mean for us? Quote, unquote, not a goddamn thing. Well, and, and that's really what it is. You know, I mean, there's the the saying that, you know, if, if you're accustomed to privilege, equality feels like oppression. And I think that's really what it is. You know, it's it's we see these these people who we see as the other, quote unquote, and they're gaining power, they're gaining influence, they're gaining rights in society. And we're threatened by that. And and of course, I just think to myself, like, so. I mean, why are you threatened by that? Like, like, talk to me about why you're threatened by that. And the only, the only answer that they can logically give is that, well, I don't like gay people. I don't like trans people. I don't want them to have power over me because they make me uncomfortable and I don't like them. Like, I mean, that's, you know what I mean? They can, they can mm-hmm. trot out a whole lot of other arguments, but if you boil it right down to it, like that's, that's what you're going to get. Fuck that. Equal, equal footing is not power over somebody else. Yeah. Well, and, and that's exactly the point. You know, it's it's what it is. It's it's not that I am gaining my autonomy in society. It's that someone else's autonomy over me is eroding, mm-hmm. if that if, if that makes sense. So, um, you know, I, I as a person who doesn't want trans people to have rights or as a person who doesn't want gay people to have rights, as I see that influence and that authority waning, you know, what you're losing is the ability to have power over other people. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and that's obviously an incredibly uncomfortable for, for position for these people to be in. Um, you know, so it's just, I mean, I mean, the raw numbers are there. I mean, these people, these people are objectively more of a threat to me than I could ever possibly be to them. Yet the narrative is, you know, if, if I gain rights in society, what's that going to mean for everyone else? And, um, you know, like I said, I just, I just don't care. Like we're yeah. talking, we're because, because what we're weighing, because what, what, what other people, the, the way that other people see it is they're weighing someone's quote unquote rights over, so my rights over another person's safety when what the conversation really is, is my safety versus your comfort. Mm-hmm. That's really what the argument is about, because if you look at if you look at it objectively, there is no way that you are justified feeling uncomfortable around a trans person. I mean, if we're, if we're talking general statistics and who hurts who. There's literally no justification you can make for a trans person making you feel unsafe. It's, it's just not. Totally. So what you're really talking about is how comfortable you are, not how safe you are, how comfortable you are. But when we look at how many trans people experience violence, then we are, we are actually talking about my safety. I mean, it's sure it's a matter of comfort, too. But when it really comes down to it, we're talking about my safety because I, as a person who generally passes for female, uh, you know, wearing you know full on makeup, wearing a dress, got my hair up, my nails painted. If I walk into a men's restroom, my safety is at stake. Like objectively, my safety is in at, at stake. Period. Like end yeah. of story. Um, but but no one wants to but no one wants to see that because because they don't care about my safety because that's not what it's about. All right. Well, on that note, uh, we are out of time. <laughs> now that we have thoroughly depressed everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, the next yeah. topic coming up is going to be uh, as depressing. Yeah. So anyway, um, Callie, where can people find you? So I host a show called The Gay Theist Manifesto, which is all about the intersection of atheist and LGBT activism. Uh, you can find the show on iTunes, on Spreaker, Stitcher, pretty much any place you can find podcasts, you can find the show. Um, you can find the blog at patheos.com slash blog slash The Gay Theist Manifesto. And uh, I'm Callie Wright on Facebook. It's C-A-L-L-I-E-W-R-I-G-H-T. I can all friend pretty much anyone. Awesome. <laughs> well, thank you very much for uh, for joining us. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, guys. It was a lot of fun. Definitely. Always happy to have you on.